All right. Thank you, Dory. Uh, can you hear me? Perfect. Yep. All right. Awesome. So thank you all for coming. Today, I want to welcome you all to our second webinar in the ISS Professional Development Series. This is the ISS Data Career Snapshot, Economic, Finance, and Data Librarianship as told by Barbara Bordelon. I am Abe Israel, Research Area Specialist at ICPSR, and today I'm helping Amy Pienta as the facilitator for this webinar. The ISS Professional Development Webinar Series offers two types of presentation formats. The first type of presentation focuses on introducing new tools, methods, and approaches to the ISS community with the goal of expanding the skills and knowledge that we bring to our job, whether it be in libra libraries, data archives, or other organizations in the data realm. The second type of presentation in our webinar series focuses on introducing the ISS community to the job or career path of one of our members. This is the format for today's webinar. Today, we will hear from Barbara Bordelon. First, Barbara will give a short presentation about the work he has been involved in over his fantastic career. I will then ask Barbara a series of questions to help deepen our understanding of Barbara's work and point of view. During the presentation and conversation with Barbara, I want to encourage you to type your questions in the, te in the text box, and I'll do my best to collect those questions and read them to Barbara. Before jumping in, let me start with a little introduction. Barbara Bordelon joined Princeton University as the economics and finance librarian in 1993, and has, and has had an expanding set of duties, including heading the data and statistical services and directing the Cultural Policy and Arts National Data Archive. Barbara has had an exemplary role in service to the profession. He, he, is an active, he is active in many associations, including the ALA and, of course, ISIS, and represents his university at various data organizations. He co-teaches the course Providing Social Science Data Services, Strategies for Design and Operation, as part of ICPSR's summer program. He has authored various articles and chapters on a wide variety of topics, including the recent chapter, Data Brarianship. Earlier this year, he received the William H. Flanagan Award for Distinguished Service as an ICPSR official representative. And in 2006, the Thompson Gale Award for Excellence in Business Librarianship. And with that, I want to welcome Barbary to the ISS webinar stage. Barbary, take it away. Thank you. So hopefully everyone is seeing the slides now. Um, so what I'm going to do is just very briefly tell you about myself and then go into various things. And as Abe said, we'll um, have questions. So let's see if it'll let me. All right. So in terms of education, uh, my undergraduate degree is in finance. That's why I often answer so many finance questions. I have an MLS and I have an MBA. Um, first job was um, temporary position at LSU, nothing to do with any of this. I went on to New Mexico State where I was one of the business reference librarians. And as Abe said, most of my career has been in Princeton. I started as the economics and finance librarian and for those of you that have been around for a while, um, you will um, know the name, uh, if not the person, Judith Rowe. So when I arrived at Princeton, data librarian was Judith. So to go back a step, um, when I started at New Mexico State, after I'd been there about a year, um, the ICPSR role was given to me. I knew nothing about ICPSR. And I attended the summer workshop, which I now teach, back then done by the three amigos, Chuck, Jim, and Diane. And um, I became the ICPSR official representative. And as I said, I moved to Princeton. So no longer the data librarian. The legendary Judith Rowe was the data librarian. She's actually working in the computing center. Um, so we would have contact and so forth. After I was here a few years, she moved into the library and we began working together much more closely. Judith retires. Um, we have an acting data librarian who wants nothing to do with data. So I kind of unofficially do things. And then we hire um, another legend in the field, Ann Gray. 
uh, Anne Gray came to us uh, four years and Anne retires. So then I become the acting data librarian. And after a year, I took over that role while continuing to do economics and finance. So I have been the OR for ICPSR since uh, 2004 at Princeton. And as I said, I'd had a brief stint before that at New Mexico State. Um, anyone that stays in a role for a long time, you do lots of acting jobs. And I've certainly had various other um, selection responsibilities. Um, see Panda. So um, the Cultural Policy and the Arts National Data Archive, which is now part of NADAC uh, over at ICPSR, uh, but this was the first cultural data project. And um, it had been going for since about 2000 uh, when I was asked to take it over. So I ran it for about nine years and uh, we sent out bids to try to find someone to take it over. The National Endowment for the Arts took it over and Amy and Allison Stroud um, took over the project. Now it's NADAC, uh, which you can get the data for free through ICPSR. But during this time, um, I was doing the bibliography. I was working with processors to add data, doing metadata, et cetera. So what do I do? Well, I think like most of you, most of my job is really helping researchers find data, interpret data, literature, et cetera. While my primary role is economics and finance, as the head of data services, um, we really handle all areas. And I will add that I work with a series of people um, in doing this. So um, Ashley Faulkner is in on the call, and um, so she will answer a lot of various questions. Jeremy Darrington, our politics librarian. But there are various people who uh, play part of this role. And then we also have data consultants. So I supervise, I do a lot of coordinating. Uh, like most of us out there, I do a fair number of classes per year. Uh, one of the other things is um, we get data in um, through purchase or sometimes for free. And um, I determine uh, how we will access the data, um, cataloging, et cetera. Um, as the ICPSR records come each week, I go through those and I um, determine what's going to go into our catalog. Uh, we have set some various rules. ICPSR does things as individual items. Uh, anything that's a series, um, I put aside and we create series records, but various ways to try to find the data. Lots of research guides, FAQs, uh, like everyone in an academic institution, I serve on various committees. And I also represent Princeton for various institutions, the Warden Research Data Service, uh, which is basically financial data. Um, as I said, I'm the OR for ICPSR, uh, the Association of Public Data Users, so various groups and different ones. I have various levels of involvement. Um, I am involved in various organizations. Um, this goes on like on my actual resume. I think I have something like five pages of committees over time, so I'm not going to bore you with all that. But the groups I'm most involved in uh, for the American Library Association, um, first and foremost really is RUSA, the Reference and User Services Association. Uh, I've served on many committees. I'm doing restructuring right now, uh, but I'm a former chair of the Business Reference and Services section. And then the other um, division that I'm involved in is ACRL. And um, I was the convener of the New American Geospatial Data Services and Academic Libraries group. And we merged with a couple of other interest groups to form a new section, the Digital Scholarship section. For those of you that are looking for ways to become involved, this is a good way because uh, we're brand new. And uh, we're about to have our first election and we'll start forming committees. Uh, one of the other things that I'm um, somewhat involved with is the Government Documents Roundtable and part of the International Documents Task Force. We have liaisons to the various groups and um, mine is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Um, other groups, IASIS, um, you know, who is sponsoring this webinar uh, with the staff of ICPSR. Um, I've largely served on various program committees and I've been running the mentoring program uh, since 2015. 
Uh, the other is uh, every state in the United States has a state data center. It works differently in each state, but in New Jersey, it's part of the Department of Labor, and I've had various stints uh, serving on its advisory board. And part of that involves answering questions to the public, uh, in our case, the state of New Jersey. Um, I've um, done various sort of formal teaching. Uh, one was a formal credit course uh, at Rutgers University on business and economics. Um, but for the last uh, few years, I have been with my amigos, Jane Fry and Ron Nakow, uh, I've been teaching um, a week-long summer course as part of the ICPSR summer program called Providing Social Science Data Services. And as I mentioned earlier, I was part of one of their early classes um, back when Chuck Humphrey, Jim Jacobs, and Diane Garassi taught it. Uh, we do plan to offer this class again in 2018. Um, no dates have been set yet, but typically it's either late July or early August, and it's a great way to um, emerge yourself into uh, the world of data, uh, basically one week solid. Um, I've written various things over time, and I've only listed a few. As mentioned, um, Linda Callum and Christy Thompson had a book last year. Uh, I had a chapter in it on data reference strategies for subject librarians. Um, a lot of what I've done over, the, over time has really been talking about networking, talking about data. So sort of on the other side, the other piece of my job, networking strategies for business and economic librarians. Um, various things on um, repackaging, cross-national uh, etc. So various things that are out there and you can look me up and find them. I spent a lot of time presenting. Um, I looked, I've done well over a hundred presentations um, at various national and international groups over the course of my career. And so um, what I did was sort of thematically put them into various things. And I find the best way honestly to learn something is when you have to present on it and talk about it. And so um, thematically, the areas that I've talked most about are building collections. Uh, I've taught um, pre-conferences on building business collections for a long time. I've done some similar um, sessions on data. Uh, I've talked a lot about what it means to have a career in business librarianship. Um, as everybody knows, I'm content, content, content. And so I always talk a lot about data sources and methodology. Uh, across a wide variety of things, Latin America, health, international finance, economics, et cetera, cultural data. Uh, I've talked about delivering data. Uh, anyone that knows me knows I despise the term big data um, or unstructured data, uh, but I've given presentations on it also, uh, talking about searching for data as well as data infrastructure. Um, it's really important to get out there and interact. Um, I serve on a lot of committees, uh, both internally as well as externally. Uh, search committees are always interesting to get to know other members of your own organization uh, and how people think. Um, the other is um, our structures for our universities or institutions are all different, but um, I've had uh, the great fortune of serving on a number of committees with our Office of Information Technology that often has some summer linkages, so that's always good. I ser I've served both formally and informally on a lot of companies' advisory boards, um, and this can be a really great way to provide information formally to a company, but I also get calls nonstop from various vendors wanting to know what I think um, about various things, and I my thing is always if it's a company I care about, I'm happy to work with them as I want to improve the product. Um, I've directed various library school in, uh, assistantships, and this is a great, great way to get people into our field. So the last sort of area I really kind of want to talk a little, well, second last area I want to talk about is uh, what do I expect in the data librarian? So I'm going down the list of attendees, and I know some of you, not all of you, um, but some of you are perhaps new, and some of you are more on the hiring end. And so what I kind of thought of is uh, we've all seen these horrible job ads out there, and often they're unfortunately not within our control. Often it's people above us who write them, but um, that asks for everything under the sun. 
So what do I want when I'm looking for a good data librarian and what as a recruiter should you be looking for? I want someone that is very flexible. Things are going to change. Um, so I'm always amused when people talk about this new field of data. Princeton's been doing this for 52 years and there are some other institutions that have been doing it longer than we have. This is not new. However, uh, it's certainly become more prominent and um, certainly uh, things change all the time. So everything from, if you go back far enough, formats, um, but certainly the way that we present service and the way that we find information. So I need flexibility. I want someone that's always curious, that always wants to learn new things. Um, they have to want to read the documentation. They have to understand the methodology. Otherwise, it's not going to do any good. While we would like to think that the researchers will do this, often they will not. So to me, it's often due diligence. I want them to leave no stone unturned. Uh, when I started at Princeton, I was told no is not an acceptable answer. Um, we may end up having a no because the stuff is not available, but we will do everything in our power to make sure that they have an alternative. Obviously, they have to have great search skills. And again, subject knowledge. I think this is so critical. Now, many of us serve multiple hats. I mentioned I do economics and finance. But it's also important that you be able to have somewhat broad knowledge cutting across the various other social science disciplines because they all work together. Everything is interdisciplinary. Uh, obviously, you have to know how to uh, conduct a proper data reference interview. Uh, as we know, just with regular reference, people rarely ask for what they want, so we need to be able to tease out what they really need. And the other thing is you need to know your strengths and weaknesses. No one can do everything. It's important to know what are you really good at, and I think it's also important that you be honest during your interview. And if there are things that you feel you're not as strong at, uh, to let them know. And if it's something that's critical that you're willing to work on it and so forth, but no one comes in knowing everything. So how do I keep up? Um, I attend a lot of these webinars. Uh, so ISIS, ICPSR does uh, quite a few. The Census Bureau uh, does various really good ones. Association of Public Data Users, you do have to be a member or pay. Um, I wanna put in a plug. Um, I don't think Linda Kellum is in on our call. But uh, Linda Kellum runs a series for the North Carolina Library Association. Um, and while the focus is on government, um, and it's not always data, I'd say about half the series are data, and you don't have to be a member of NCLA. I'm obviously not. And she gets the best speakers out there talking about a wide variety of topics. So if you just Google NCLA GRS, uh, you can sign up for the webinars that are relevant. Right now, she's doing a series focusing on um, various state data. Um, obviously, listservs, uh, the ISIS listserv, um, all of us know how valuable it is for answering questions, uh, but others uh, that are re relevant to your subjects, like in my case, Biz Lavelle, um, read. Uh, the thing, ISIS quarterly is free. You know, read what happens in it, read the various um, subject related journals in your field, uh, product reviews, et cetera, are really good. Uh, attend conferences when you can. I know that uh, that's not always possible. Uh, sorry for the typo in ISIS, I will fix that. And, uh, but ICPSR just had their fall OR conference. ISIS um, always meets late May, early June. This year will be in Montreal. Uh, American Library Association, subject conferences, et cetera. Network, network, network. Um, the most important thing you can have at a conference is meeting people. The most invaluable thing to me for IASIS is knowing my international colleagues from around the world. Um, as you go on in time, present. Uh, certainly something like IASIS, if no one presents, we don't have a conference. So share your knowledge. It's really important. Uh, if you have things uh, to say, uh, whether about subjects or practices, et cetera, write about them. Um, Karsten, I would uh, be remiss if I didn't say, um, you know, he always is looking for things for ISIS quarterly, so certainly a place to publish. A uh, mentor, um, you know, as I said, I have the mentoring program for ISIS, uh, but also just, you know, reach out when people ask you questions. Uh, at some point, you know, you will be a mentor and a mentee, I guarantee you, because there's always something new uh, for us to learn.
So it works both ways. So now what I would like to do is open up, um, I guess, um, Abe and uh, Amy may have questions, and then to open it up to the public and um, just sort of your thoughts about um, about a career in librarianship and data librarianship and so forth and what it means to you. So um, Abe and Amy. Yeah, I, I'll take it from here. So once again, I encourage all the participants to write your questions in the in the text box and I'll ask them as they come up. Um, but I would like to just jump right in and thanks again, Barbara, for your, for your service in this space, but also for giving us a little bit of insight on what you've done over the years. Um, the first question is actually a really easy one and I, I'm really excited about this one because I haven't attended ISS in the past. And now that I'm going in 2018 to Montreal, I'm really, really excited about it. Um, so the first question is, what was your favorite ISS meeting destination and why? Um, I love ISS because we get to go to uh, places all over the world, so that's really nice. Um, let's see, my favorite, I would actually say probably, probably my first one, which was Edinburgh, Scotland. Um, right. it, was, it was international, it was just a lot of fun. I remember uh, we always have a banquet uh, so I'm not even talking about presentations or anything else, but there's always a banquet. And uh, that year they had um, what started out as a group of bagpipers. And everybody was thinking, okay, how long can we listen to bagpipers? And they played about half a song on the bagpipes that was sort of traditional Scottish music. And then all of a sudden they went into sort of rock music with still bagpipes and one of them jumped on a table and started rocking out. And um, so you get to go to interesting places, you get to meet interesting people, and um, I've made some really good friends from around the world. So I'd say, you know, all of them over time, but as I said, that one probably was my first because it was just so different than anything else I'd ever attended. That's incredible. That's incredible. Um, let's hope, let's see if there are any bagpipe players in Montreal <laughs> next year. But you also heard it here, folks, that the food is also incredible. So if you're not going for the presentations and the networking and the bagpipes, the food is also incredible. So check it out. Um, the, the next question I have is, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Um, I can't really do anything. So, um, <laughs> no, I mean, this is kind of interesting because all the way back to high school, every job I've ever had um, has actually been in libraries, like including high school. I did, um, during college, I very briefly did um, reading for the blind, but honestly, I really don't know how to do anything else. So I would actually be in great trouble. <laughs> that actually ties me into the follow-up question. Um, when you were in undergrad or in high school, is, is this what you thought you would have been doing back then? No, <laughs> um, absolutely not. So uh, despite having only worked in libraries during high school and college, uh, largely, uh, my undergraduate degree was in finance. I thought I was going to go into that. Uh, when I graduated, I'm from Louisiana. The economy had completely tanked. Oil prices were down to nothing and uh, there were no jobs. And um, the librarian back at my local public library convinced me to go to library school and um, essentially that my business background would be valuable. And um, because business, so much of it is data related, this sort of led into what I currently do. Awesome, awesome. And just to, to wrap it around, is there a profession that you would not like to do? Um, I would say probably many, but um, <laughs> I probably answer more questions involving health economics than anything else, but I'm very squeamish. So I definitely um, <laughs> could not be a doctor as I think I would probably pass out upon seeing anyone's blood. So I can answer questions about, um, about health, but I couldn't actually help anyone. Awesome. All right, I'm taking two questions from the audience right now. And the first question is, what is your strategies or what are your strategies for learning and understanding about data documentation and methodologies? 
Uh, read, read, read. I mean, um, it's a cumulative process, and so obviously the more data sets that you look at, um, you know, the more over time you start appreciating what works and what doesn't work. Um, you know, skim obviously, but the main things I would say is really to look at how was it conducted, um, who's included, who's not included, uh, sort of the universe, et cetera. And um, if there's some type of user guide associated with it, uh, to skim that and just to build cumulative knowledge over time. And if you can, um, you know, do charts, do FAQs, do things like that, because it's sort of a quick way to um, remember things. I've done a lot of comparison charts over time of various data sets. And while I say I do them for the students, the reality is I do them probably more for myself uh, because it makes it much nicer to much easier when I'm sitting down with the student to be able to quickly rule things out. Okay. Okay. Awesome. I, uh, the, another question that I just received is someone said that they are a RDM officer slash data librarian for economics and business administration, but they find it really difficult to find information on RDM specifically for ec economics and finance within all the information of all the other social sciences. Do you have some tips to find more information on repositories for economics, DMPs, for economics, DMPs for quote unquote, she's sorry, or he's sorry, for big data research analysis, et cetera. Do you have tips for that? Um, I had a question recently from someone from one of the feds, and I'm not sure if this is the person asking, but um, in, in economics at least, uh, while many of the top journals have requirements for depositing your data, the reality is because we're often almost always using proprietary data we can't share. So uh, one of the questions I had recently from someone from one of the feds is, okay, we understand that the data can rarely be shared, but, um, and we understand that yes, you deposit your do files, your dictionary files, et cetera, um, but how do we get the funding agencies to understand this? Well, hopefully the funding agencies understand that if something is um, proprietary, such as a CompuStat or CRISP or something, you can't. Um, so, uh, but there are a number of organizations. I said, like the American Economic uh, Association is starting to, uh, those things that are available, you will find. Um, there's um, Journal of Economic History is now part of ICPSR. They have their data site there. And of course, many of the things that we use are publicly available. But in terms of writing a data management plan, et cetera, uh, first thing I would say is my guess is most of you probably don't get a lot of these questions in reality. I mean, I think there's ways, there's a lot of emphasis on this. But this tends to be a small part of what we do, but it's really just to keep in mind what are they using. And again, if they're using proprietary data that, um, that they document well what they did, that they talk about how they subset and they provide perhaps their dictionary and do files, uh, but the data may not be able to be shared um, unless it's something they've collected themselves. Awesome, awesome. I keep getting a, a lot of questions in the, the text field, so I'm, I'm gonna just keep going with these questions right. instead of the questions that I've had. Um, I have one here that, do you have any suggestions for the most important training to pursue for, humani for humanitarian, humanities librarian that is only recently assigned to data librarianship. For instance, how important is it to have hands-on training and abilities in statistics, data processing, data curation, et cetera? Um, well, I, as I said, no one can do everything. So um, I would say look at your institution and see if there are other people on campus that are providing help with the statistical packages. Um, the what you use may be different. Um, we don't see a lot of people at Princeton in terms of uh, humanities. Every once in a while we'll get a religion major or someone else who that's a small part of their project. Uh, but if we're talking more digital humanities, that's sort of really a different set of skills. Um, and our text analysis in the social sciences is very different than what's done in the humanities. Um, that I, I will say the digital scholarship section, uh, one of the parts of it is digital humanities. So um, perhaps contacting people uh, involved in that, uh, it's not really part of my job. 
Uh, but as I said, if you just Google ACRL Digital Humanities, you could find some contact information and people who are heavily involved in that area. Okay, perfect. Um, this was a question, just kind of a, a follow-up clarity question on a previous statement that you made. And it is, how important, if at all, is it to know how to do the various kinds of data analysis? Is this what you mean by when you say methodology? Um, it's not what I mean. Um, so I am fortunate at Princeton that uh, I know there are a lot of places out there that are one person shops where one person is expected to do everything. They're finding the data, they're um, keeping up with all the stat packages, et cetera. Um, at Princeton, we have um, statistical consultants who um, focus on that part of the thing. So my job is to um, help someone find the data, to explain to them. Uh, in terms of methodology, um, I'm not talking methods, which is, you know, oh, we'll use a probit versus a regression, et cetera. Um, that, um, at most universities, I know that typically it's faculty. At Princeton, it's often uh, our stat consultants who are doing that. For me, methodology, I really mean for the survey itself. So how was it conducted? Who was included? Who was not included? Or institutional populations except, uh, included? Uh, what are the age limits? Um, um, things like, uh, you know, are men included, women included? What are the age brackets? What are the exclusions, et cetera? Uh, what are the skip patterns? Uh, so really about the documentation more than anything else and the design of it, as opposed to what method you will use to present your results. Okay. And just uh, someone, Alison Labonte, uh, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Um, she's basically giving a shout out to the book of essays, Data Brilliantship, which Bob, May, Bob Ray mentioned, it has an essay about that in there as well. So check it out. And uh, awesome. Uh, so another question that we have is, uh, what advice would you have for, for someone who's just starting their career in data, data librarianship? Um, I think you've either chosen or accidentally chosen a great career. Um, it's an area with a lot of growth. Uh, what I would say is if you're just starting out, I know this sounds like a, um, shameless self-plug, uh, but um, if you can, uh, I highly recommend the summer workshop um, that focuses on providing social science data services done by CPSR, because it is a way to immerse yourself for a week into all the different areas. So we cover collection development, we cover reference, we cover uh, many different areas. So it really is a way to, as I said, immerse yourself, which uh, one rarely gets the opportunity. Um, the other thing I would say is uh, not everybody gets to do this, obviously, um, is um, read, take advantage of all the free stuff. I assist, um, you know, even if you can't go to the conferences, uh, the listserv is very valuable. Most of the presentations often takes a year or so, but the presentations almost always, uh, the slides at least, are made available for free on their website. ISIS quarterly is free. Often there are more detailed explanations of some of the presentations as well as original articles. Um, attend as many webinars as you can. Um, I find everything is valuable. So um, I try to attend every ICPSR webinar there is. Uh, even if I think I know the topic, um, there's always something extra that I learn from it. Um, so just attend as much as you can, you know, whether it's virtually or in real. Perfect. Perfect. Is there a favorite part of the job as being a data librarian that you would like to share? Um, I would, I guess probably my favorite really, it's not even so much the job per se, but it's really the colleagues from around the world, um, you know, getting to know them, um, et cetera. But in terms of the job itself, um, I would say just like seeing someone smile, seeing someone um, thinking that they have something impossible and finding something that will work or their advisor perhaps has said, I don't think this is going to happen and perhaps it doesn't, but reworking it so that they actually have a feasible topic. Awesome. So that actually ties directly into my next question. Could you pre please describe a moment when you had that wow factor, that wow moment that you realized that your work 
made a difference in the world. Can you tell us of a time? Um, well, I would say this actually happens, you know, almost on a daily basis. So, um, I mean, there's the formal things such as acknowledgments that show up in faculty publications and dissertations, etc. Um, and sometimes where you didn't even know you made a difference and you have this really nice acknowledgement where they say that this would not have happened without you. But um, one of the things that's interesting about Princeton is all seniors are required to do a thesis, not just honor students, all juniors are required to do substantive independent work. And so they're, they're often doing really complex things. They may not have the subject knowledge yet at this point. And so they come in with topics um, that are interesting, but not always quite feasible. And so I would say just, um, you know, just so much of what I do every day is taking something that's very unshaped and working it and then, you know, and then seeing them. Um, and certainly at the end of the year, when someone goes on to win awards and so forth, uh, you know, local awards, uh, but for their uh, senior thesis, et cetera, you know, you always know that um, you've played a part in that. And that's certainly a wow moment. Great. What, what do you feel has been your greatest accomplishment during your time at Princeton? Um, I would actually, I would probably say, um, as sad as it is, but having people go on to other places and um, to carry on the work. So um, Todd Hines, who is now at Stanford, uh, practically killed me when he left, but uh, <laughs> knowing that he's doing amazing work there, Phoebe Dixon, uh, now at Drexel, um, Dan and Christy now at University of Windsor. So really things like that. I think it's it's seeing people that you've worked with, um, you know, maybe mentored, uh, go on to other things and continue to spread. As I mentioned earlier, uh, when you do assistantships and so forth, um, most library schools don't really have very good training for data. Uh, there are a few places that have classes, but very few. So I think if you can work with people and get them involved in the field, um, you know, that's probably one of the most rewarding. Okay, awesome, awesome. Uh, I have two more questions here. Uh, again, I encourage you to, to write some more questions in the, in the text box, as I have two more here for you. Barbara, are you ready? Let's yes. Just jump, let's just jump in it. Okay, what do you think is the future of data services slash infrastructure slash data librarianship? Well, as I said, I, I think it's very bright. I think that it's one of the few growth fields. Um, I think that um, it's going to probably continue to become more specialized because just like all areas, the areas that we get asked uh, tend to be the really complex. So I think the subject expertise is really important. Uh, in terms of infrastructure, et cetera, um, certainly what I'm hoping to see more of is um, that the various groups out there work together. So um, having an ICPSR work with GASIS, work with the UKDA uh, to have transparent catalogs. What I would like to see really is the equivalent of a WorldCat uh, that would be, uh, so WorldCat for those of you that are not so much on the book side, but WorldCat is the way OCLC is the way that we know the holdings of various libraries, but it tends to be books and journals. What I would like to see is an integrated catalog that would combine GESIS, UKDA, ICPSR, the Australian Data Archive, South African Archive, et cetera, so that uh, we could have, and I think it's very possible now because with standards like DDI, et cetera, um, we have a common language that would allow uh, searching across. Great, great. All right, uh, the last question that I have here is, what's the most interesting slash fun slash ridiculous data collection you've ever seen? <laughs> I love this question. Wow, uh, I honestly don't know. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think of, I'm really not sure. Um, so much of what I deal with is, not so interesting, quite frankly. <laughs> uh, I mean, they're interesting in their own ways. Um, I, I would, one of the things that we always talk about is data not going back. 
um, you know, unless someone has done some small projects. So I, I think some of the historical projects uh, are probably some of the more interesting to me, even though I'm not a historian. So things like uh, the Cross National Time Series that takes things back to the 1800s and includes places that don't exist. Um, I think a lot of the stuff, honestly, that's being done, again, while I don't do much in the humanities, I think a lot of the work that they're doing is really fascinating. Um, and, you know, the other is, um, you know, again, it's sort of personal, but um, a lot of the work that we did for CPANDA now in NADAC, uh, I think is really interesting because it's an area that kind of is the combination of the social sciences and the arts. And so things like taking um, opera bulletins over time and turning it into data, taking symphony repertoires and turning it into data. So I'd say it's more sort of the creative type stuff like that that I find really interesting, even though I don't tend to get to do a lot with it. No problem. No problem. Thank you so much for that feedback. I, I am getting some more questions here. Just when I thought it was just two more, I have two more again after that. So the next question is actually a comment and a question. And uh, she says, you have said that library schools don't have great training in data. For a current MLI, MLIS student, what courses do you think are most useful in training as a data librarian? Well, um, very few places have an actual data class. I know there are a few that do. So obviously, if one does, take it. But uh, barring that, um, I would say um, the basic skills, which unfortunately a lot of those are being taken away from library schools. I think it's important that you have uh, the basic reference class. Uh, a lot of the stuff does translate while they may focus on books and so forth. The reality is a lot of it translates. So I think that's important, sort of the skills. And the other, which I think most schools have gotten rid of, and I think it's critical, is cataloging. And that's really understanding how we structure things. You know, in data, we say DDI, and um, in the um, books world, it's MARC and then RDA. Uh, but I'd say really kind of the basic things are really important. And the other is uh, if your school offers any subject-based classes, take those. Because again, even if the focus isn't data per se, understanding more about the field is really critical because you're going to get questions across a wide variety of fields that are not necessarily your background. Awesome. And the last thing that I got is a kind of a plug from Todd Quinn. He mentioned uh, this interesting data set is data is plural weekly and there's an email for it and a website that I can share with the rest of the community. Um, uh, but the last thing that I have to ask here is if someone wants to work with you moving forward or want to or wants to contact you, um, is there a way to reach you, uh, social media, to follow you on um, maybe on Twitter, Instagram, you know? Is there a way that people can reach out to you and see more of what you're doing? Um, I am like anti-social media, so I do not do Twitter <laughs> or Facebook or any of that. Uh, you can always email me, uh, which I should have had up. Um, I can, I'll type that in. Uh, after, but uh, Bordelon at Princeton.edu. Um, honestly, just, I mean, this sounds uh, slightly odd, but Google me. Uh, as I said, I, you know, I, I'm, um, you know, rarely an ALA or an ISIS or an ICPSR conference am I not presenting uh, on something. So um, certainly that's, that's an easy way, but no, I'm kind of anti-social media. I understand, I understand, but um, you, uh, you will be there at ISIS 2018. Are you presenting? Um, well, I'm on the program committee, and uh, the program has not actually been set yet. <laughs> but uh, but yes, I have um, um, uh, with some various colleagues. Uh, Mara Blake is coordinating, but uh, the plan is uh, I will be part of a session that will focus. Uh, so at the last IASIS in Lawrence, Kansas, there was a session talking about uh, that Harrison Decker organized talking about um, problems with collecting data. And so Mara had a thought to kind of expand that to talk about less traditional formats. So things like arts data, images, GIS data, etc. And so we've put together a proposal for a panel focusing on that. So um, Hopefully it will be accepted and uh, you'll be able to see that and we want to make it quite discussion oriented. Um, I will be at 
um, ALA, both uh, midwinter as well as annual, uh, American Library Association, um, but um, not planning to present anything there this time. Understood. Well, I think that should be it for our time. I want to give special thanks to Bob Ray for speaking with us and especially for all the work that you've done in the space. As a reminder, the recording will be available on YouTube and it will be shared on the ISS listed. So please stay tuned for our next webinar in the series and it's gonna be early 2018, either in January or in February. And of course, if you have any suggestions or topics of speakers, please contact Amy Pianta here at ICPSR and we look forward to hearing you in the next webinar. Thanks again for joining us.